This episode of the Golf Professional Growth Project is brought to you by Golf Genius Software. Less work, more fun, more revenue. You are listening to the Golf Professional Growth Project. My name is Dean Candle, and I'm on a mission to help you, today's golf professional, build the skills it takes to thrive at work and succeed in life. I'm going beyond the traditional education that focuses on golf-specific training and digging deeper to find the real skills, the methods, and the tactics that the most successful people inside and outside of our industry use every day to achieve long-term success. Welcome to episode two of the Golf Professional Growth Project. Thank you for joining me. Rarely a day goes by that I don't listen to at least a few minutes of a podcast. For the last several years, there are a few shows that are a part of my regular listening routine, and the Learning Leader podcast by Ryan Hawk is one of them. Ryan has emerged as an authority on leadership after nearly 400 interviews of some of the most talented and accomplished leaders today. As he tells us, this has served as his leadership education. Ryan was an accomplished college quarterback. You also may recognize his last name from his brother, AJ, who played for Ohio State as well as the Green Bay Packers. Now, during our wide-ranging conversation, we talk about what systems for managing his work and life he cannot live without, including his morning routine and how he manages work and home. We're all looking for ways to better manage our work-life balance. We also talk about what he would say to someone that thinks leadership isn't worth their time. And if that's you, it's worth listening to his answer. Pay special attention to his advice about hiring. So many of us are in charge of hiring people, but it's not something we get any formal training or coaching about. And Ryan goes into detail about how to hire better. Be sure to check out Ryan's podcast, and I recommend his new book, Welcome to Management, not only for new and aspiring managers, but any of us that are in charge of others. I ask you also, since this show is new and it's so important that if you like it, you rate and subscribe. I truly appreciate it. That helps others find the show and will help spread the word to our golf professional colleagues and friends. So here it is, my conversation with Ryan Hawk. First off, thanks so much for taking some time to do this. I know how busy you are. So this was uh, this was really cool for me. I've been a big fan for a while and I really sure. appreciate it. Yeah, man. Thanks for having me. Yeah, I've been following Learning Leader podcast um, now for a couple years and been really impressed with all the content you've put out there and now leading up to the book, which it sounds like has been a real success for you. Forbes called it the best leadership book of 2020, so that's pretty high praise. And as somebody that's read it, I can really uh, attest to uh, how great a resource it is. So congrats on the book. I'm sure it was a challenge to get done and quite a, quite a relief once you got it done. Yeah. Thank you. I appreciate that. It, um, is completely different than a podcast, you know, sitting down and writing and getting everything, uh, from your mind onto a page and then the editing process, all of it. Uh, it was good. It was, it, I, I enjoy, uh, some of the, the, the aspects of emptying my mind <laughs> onto the page. I think that can be a useful exercise for all of us to do. And so I, I'm happy to see at least it turned into a book that could help other people. Yeah, I mean, especially the topic, and that and that's what drove me to it. Obviously, as a fan of yours, but just the specific topic itself seems like it's so underserved. In I know in my industry, in the golf industry, I, you know, give you a little background about what typically happens for us is that a lot of times, aspiring golf professionals they want to be a head golf professional or a GM or a director of golf at a club and. Uh, we'll go through our, our tenure as an assistant professional. And then a lot of times clubs are hiring uh, young men and women in their in late 20s, early 30s for these management roles where we're we're now jumping in, leading teams of sometimes dozens of people after being an individual contributor. We have hundreds or thousands of members and customers at our clubs. 
And now we're managing, you know, multi-million dollar budgets when before we were running tournaments on a daily basis and doing some clinics and lessons and hopefully just learning as we went along from hopefully some some good mentors. But the specifics on how to jump in and 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 do all that well, it's not really out there for us in our industry. So that's why the topic of this book jumped out to me. Good. I wouldn't have I wouldn't have necessarily thought that. Uh I'm a big fan of golf. I actually watch a lot of golf. I'm happy it's back. Um, and I play a few times a year, but desperately need uh, <laughs> some help to hit the ball straighter. But uh, yeah, no, that's why when you when you reached out, I was I was very curious. Thought maybe I could uh, somehow get better. But golf, like a lot of things, you uh i'm not gonna get better talking about it i'm gonna get better getting the reps and getting on the range and and getting my distances down and and figuring out why the club face is open when i'm making contact with the ball even though it doesn't feel like it should be or whatever uh yeah that 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 to me uh is what i was initially curious about so it it is interesting that that your kind of world and mine uh, collide here which I, i i was excited to talk about well, for those of us that grew up playing golf and didn't grow up playing football, this was we love how golf's this great equalizer against oh. these against these athletes that are, you know, bigger and faster than me. You know, we get on a course and uh and all of a sudden What's your background like with golf? What all have you done golf wise? Um, so I grew up playing and grew up playing golf as a junior. I uh, mm-hmm. and uh, knew kind of as a teenager that I wanted to get in the golf business. It wasn't something that I was going to play professionally, uh, which is, you know, some people get into my my part of the business having played professionally and maybe didn't go well and they want to stay in the game. Uh, but as I was coming up through high school, universities were starting these professional golf management programs mm-hmm. and where you could go to college and get a degree and come out as a golf professional. And that coincided. Penn State had a program where I wanted to go anyway, this was just, you know, all, all the stars lined up. So where I wanted to go, they had this program. And so at that point, then you go through the program, you graduate, you're doing internships during, during college, and then you just get out and, and jump in at a club and try to work your way up through the ranks. But, um, but from a playing standpoint, you know, we play professionally locally, you know, against each other, um, try to keep our games up. So what's, what is your game at right now? Like if you go out and play a normal course, what are you going to shoot? Um, average around low seventies. Man, so God, that would be great. I've never shot in the seventies in my life. I've gotten some close, but uh, now I'm not really close. But that's that's that would make golf so much more fun. <laughs> they say, you know, as long as you don't take it too seriously. Yeah, people, you know, I'm ready to really take this up and take it seriously. I'm like, whoa, whoa, whoa! You're having a good time with it right now. Just kind of enjoy it, but. I'm sure yeah. you're a competitive guy and you're not going to, yeah. you know, if you're going to do it, just, you're going to want to go out and Yeah, you know, well. it just it's just frustrating to get out there and feel like I'm I you want to do it properly and then you, you know, you hit it over there. You know, and then it happened and then I'm like, "Wait, why?" You know, I I've always like in football, I could always if something was off, I could adjust the very next throw or or whatever it may be and get back on track. And I think the good golfers and you, obviously you can attest this, you know exactly why you, you miss a shot or you hit it to the right or the left. Whereas when I play golf and I hit it over there, I, I don't know the the immediate fix. And that's the frustrating part about it is I want to correct the mistake, but it's hard to correct the mistake if you can't properly diagnose it. Uh, you know, And that's why when you do hit the good shots and you feel it, you want to keep coming back and say like, I could, you know, I, I can get better, but it's just like anything in life. It's a great metaphor for life. I believe because you, if you want to be great at anything, you've got to get the reps. You got to, you got to get out there and do it, whether it's speaking on a stage or doing a podcast or writing or whatever it may be. If you're not regularly consistently getting the reps, then how could I expect my golf game to improve dramatically if I'm on a course three times a year? It's not going to happen, you know. So I think that's that's the that's like the good reminder for me is stop complaining unless you want to do something about it and actually get out on the golf course and play more, you know. Right, and that's one of the challenges for high achievers in golf. I think when playing golf, you know, and you know, I always say sports like football, you can go out, you can run, you can just you can just try harder, you can hustle more. You're having a bad game, but you know, you can still give it your all and and get everything out 
out of that game that you possibly can if you're not having a great day. Now, as a quarterback, it's more magnified probably than in some other positions sometimes. But in golf, you just can't decide to try harder. And, in fact, that hurts you the harder you try. <laughs> yeah. So. yeah. Yeah, that's why it's so frustrating, you know. <laughs> Let me take how I performed on in this sport or in this part of my life and take that to the golf course. And I, I remember some of the times when I was actually starting to hit the ball hit the ball a lot better is when I was just basically trying to uh just smooth shots, you know, take like an extra club and smooth it up to be like, hey, okay, this is an eight iron. I'm actually gonna hit a seven and and swing lighter and for whatever reason all of a sudden i'm starting to hit the ball more flush it's it's weird golf is tough i could talk about my bad golf game all day i know you didn't come here you didn't want me to come here to talk about that but uh anyway that's that's that was what was on my mind as we were preparing for this talk so anybody out in ryan's area you're in dayton area Ryan, yeah right all yeah. right ryan needs help people. i do so help him yeah i do i'm here. actually playing with my dad and my brother tomorrow uh in columbus uh, as our Father's Day gift to my dad every year, um, as we we go out and play around a golf with him, and uh, yeah, so it'll be fun. I'm excited to get back on on the course with, especially just the company being with my family and and having a good time. And you know, you will be frustrated part of the time when we hit bad shots, but maybe I'll make a putt or something, and we have fun. So yeah, it's it's that's the cool thing about golf too is you really get quality time with 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 friends and family. I love that aspect of it. What about the trash talking though amongst dad and oh yeah and your brother? Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, we we my brother and I really make fun of my dad. Uh, he's the ultimate leader. He's the greatest at pretty much everything he does, and he's not a good golfer. He's left handed. He slices the ball all the time. He's working on it, but just has not figured it out. And he plays every day, so mm -hmm. uh, yeah, he uh, doesn't have his, the excuse that we have. But uh, that's that's partially why we make fun of him so much. Uh, <laughs> but it's all with love and fun. But yeah, we give him a hard time, and we have a rule. And I, I'd be curious as a as an actual real professional golfer like you, my brother and I's rule is you can't. There are no gimmies. So mm. even if you have a one inch putt, you have to. The, the hole is not over until the ball is at the bottom of the cup every time, no matter what, with no exceptions. And if you pick it up, then it, we there's penalties, especially we have little bets in the line. So he knows, and our friends now, and 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 it always becomes an argument. But that's our rule that we've stuck to. And because I played with people when they give you these four and a half footers that you're going to miss half the time, not you, but me will miss half the time. So we've we built this rule like we there are no gimmies no matter what. And it frustrates others. But I just feel like when I watch golf on TV, they don't have you know, they have to put they have to make the putts in their tournament. So like we make people make putts. I'd be curious to get your thoughts on why maybe I'm wrong with that. Oh, you're not wrong. I mean, you play golf until the ball's in the hole. That's right. the way the, right. the sport is played. But there is this, this weird etiquette. Exactly that. You know, oh, that's good. Pick it up. We're just playing for fun. But but meanwhile, people still do it when they have money on the line. They're playing against their buddies. Uh, and then they post the score like all those putts were going to go in. And as to your point, you know that they're not going to. Exactly. But this is, you know, this just <laughs> you can tell that you didn't come up playing golf because, you know, <laughs> Nobody handed you a touchdown from the two yard line, right? You exactly. had to get the ball over the goal line. Yeah, exactly. So anyway, that's one of our rules. I don't think everyone likes it, but uh, I firmly will will die on that hill. I think we, you have no matter where you're at, even in match play, I see those guys in the Ryder Cup, or wherever, hey, just put the ball, you know. Yeah. And I saw when Tiger would get mad sometimes when he's playing, they wouldn't, he wouldn't, he wouldn't let him pick it up. Uh, I, I always thought that was a better way to play. It There's doesn't slow the game down there. that much either. I think some people say it's for speed. You know, maybe it saves a little bit of time. Yeah. <laughs> right. So anyway, they sorry. To say they made par. But so yeah. <laughs> we've been talking, you know, kind of um, behind the scenes here about your, your background and your history. Not everybody knows all that. But uh, if people aren't familiar with the podcast and the learning leader podcast and, and how you kind of made your way to that and how you built that. Let's give the audience a little bit of, of background about how you got to this point. Sure. So uh, my podcast is called the learning leader show. I've been doing it for more than five years, 375 plus episodes, or we'll be here sh shortly. Um, uh, I started it. So I got, I was working at a company called Lexus Nexus as a sales leader, uh, as in a director role. I just finished getting my MBA. It took me six years. I was doing it one class, one semester at a time. 
Um, and as I finished my MBA, my company paid fifty two fifty a year, five thousand two hundred fifty bucks a year towards uh, continuing education. So I felt like if I wasn't using that money, I was wasting it. Um, and so uh, I looked to go back to school um, after finishing my MBA because I wanted to use that money uh, that the company set aside for reimbursement if you were to go to a, um, get a, a further your education, which was awesome. But um, I also didn't love all aspects of uh, getting my MBA, of the classes or the teachers. I mean, some of them were good. Some of them weren't. And at the same time, I was a really big podcast listener uh, to shows, people like Joe Rogan, Brian Koppelman, Terry Gross on Fresh Air. And so I, I, I listened to these shows um, and... I also was fortunate to have a dinner set up with Todd Wagner and Todd is Mark Cuban's business partner. And um, uh, before dinner, I was able to meet up with Todd and we had a kind of a one on one conversation where I got to ask him all about um, his the beginnings of broadcast dot com. That, that's the business that him and Mark built until uh, eventually sell it to Yahoo for more than five billion dollars, making him and Mark billionaires. And, and we went back and forth and he was really kind and generous with his time and knowledge. And I thought, well, instead of going back to school, I'd like to do this. I want to have long form conversations with people like Todd, who are both wise and kind and generous, really smart and have lived a life of excellence. I want to do that. And, I, and that could become hopefully my leadership PhD program that I could build for myself. And if I record those conversations, the, the positives that could come from that are one, it would build some sort of platform, which then could give me the opportunity to speak with other people like Todd, because they, they may be more apt to do it if there's an actual official platform built. And two, others could also listen and learn along with me. And the, the thought of being able to help others as I was progressing, as I was growing, as I was learning was very attractive to me. And, and, and the name Learning Leader comes from the fact that my favorite leaders that I've ever been around, that I've had the good fortune to either play for as a player or work for or work alongside, they were the types who were always striving to, to, to grow, to improve, to learn, to get better. Their heads were in their books. They're taking notes. Whenever they would open up a, a meeting, they would share some story from an article or a book they had read. They were learning leaders. And so uh, that's why it got the name. And, you know, I started as just something on the side for fun as a way to learn. And, and, and uh, you never know what's going to happen when you decide to start publishing your work, though. And in this case, it, it, it caught on and, um, you know, really hit the top of the charts in iTunes back when 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 uh, I started and. And, and that just kept the, the snowball building until eventually, uh, almost three years ago, I was, you know, the, the idea to do this full time as, as, a, as my business um, was brought to me by my friend Doug Meyer, who is a big supporter and now business partner of mine. Uh, I left corporate America to do this full time. Uh, it'll be three years in November. And so that's, uh, that's, that's the somewhat long version of the story. It could be much longer, but I try to scale it down for you. No worries at all. So if you ha now you're you're approaching 400 episodes. You just said going to be 375 mm -hmm. soon. Yep. If you had, you've probably done this. So I don't think I'm throwing for a loop. You for a loop. But if you had to scale down now the definitive skills of a great leader, if if you were teaching this to school age children, here's what I, I've learned are the the major skills you need in order to to be successful as a leader, what would those drill down to? Yeah. Um, and I don't know how this would play with a younger person because I'm thinking of my younger self and I don't know what I would think, but, but if I had to use just two words, um, even though there really are probably 20, but if I had to use two words, they would be first would be very thoughtful people. Um, so the, the, the excellent leaders who are sustaining excellence, the high achievers, um, the productive achievers are the ones who are regularly taking a step back to analyze themselves, the world around them as well as educate themselves. They're learners, right? They're thoughtful people. So they're, they're, they have the ability to pause, reflect, analyze what I've done, what's worked, what hasn't, what should I keep doing? And that has helped them 
continue to perform at levels like this where they're increasing their performance on a daily basis. And two, they're very intentional with their actions. So thoughtfulness and intentionality are really the twin pistons of growth as I've written about. And I think though that that's what I would say are the commonalities, meaning that the people who act with intentionality don't just wander haphazardly through life. They have intention with what they're doing every day. They said, yes, right, Dean, to do this podcast with you for a specific reason, because I was excited to share my message with someone who wrote me uh, a compelling cold email. And I, I wanted to be a part of it. I wanted to help. And also part of this is I vividly remember, and this is still happening for me, people who have given their time to me to be on my show, especially near the beginning of it. And when I try to come up with some way to pay them back and all that those people would tell me was just do it for somebody else, just, just pay it forward. And so I try to live that way as well, but that's with great intention. And so there's, there's always thought and there's always intention with everything we're going to do, right? We're playing golf tomorrow with my dad as our way to celebrate Father's Day, right? To, to, to spend time together because we love each other and we love being together. Well, we have to act with intention, get it on the calendar, get the tee time set. We're playing at this course in Columbus, right? So all of those things I, I've, I've learned from those leaders and tried to implement into my life so that I'm I'm actually walking the talk, like doing what I'm what I'm learning and not just writing it down in a book or putting it on a website, but but trying to experiment and learn from the people that I've I've been had the good fortune to talk to over the years. Well, you consistently ask everybody this this question initially in each episode. Anybody that listens is going to hear this about asking this leader, you know, what what um, traits they they believe are necessary to sustain excellence over time. And I know, obviously, as you just pointed out, a, a lot of that, I guess, has been drilled down to being thoughtful and yep. intentional. Mm-hmm. What's the, what are ones that stand out, though, answers that you got that specifically you just you implemented right away that, that stand out to you from some of the great leaders you've interviewed? Um, I, the, the one that I think of... Uh, that, that immediately pops to my mind is when I talked to Cat Cole, episode 78. It's been years now since I talked to Cat, and I don't know if you've listened to that one, but it, if, if you haven't, it's, you'll, you'll like it. But um, sh- the way that she described it that I try to think about for myself and for others is that the productive achievers, uh, like think of this scale that's equally weighted. And on one side of the scale, these leaders are confident and courageous. So they believe in themselves, they believe in their ability, that confidence has been built up by uh, momentum created from success to success. I've won the game or I prepared properly and then I went out and did well. They're courageous. They, they have courage to stand up for what they believe in, even if it's not the popular thing, right? So this combination of confidence and courage on one side, but then equally balanced out is they are very curious and they are humble, realizing I haven't got it all figured out. I still need to learn and grow and develop. And I'm going to I'm gonna follow my intellectual curiosity with great rigor. Uh, also, they have a humility about them, meaning I need your help. I need the, I need the insight from others and I'm going to be working on gathering that. I'm not going to believe that I've got it. Like I said, I've got all the answers or I've got it figured out. And so I think that balance of of being very, uh, having confidence and courage in myself, as well as keeping curiosity and humility right here is important. Val, the issue is if one of those gets too far out of balance, if you're just the confident, courageous person, you may, you may be the metaphorical bull in a China shop, just ramming yourself through everything, knocking everything down in your path. Likewise, if you're just curious and humble, you may be the person sitting in the corner just taking notes all day, never taking action. And so that's why it's important that this is an equally balanced way to approach your your life, your job as a leader. And doing so uh, can be very beneficial. And I learned that from Kat years ago, and I still, still think about it uh, to this day. I think as I've heard you mention that before, that's when I think of those, you know, equal sides of that scale, it 
to me, it stands out that as you work your way up the ladder, whatever job it may be, and that confidence and that courage is really, really important to to give you that belief that you can make it and that you need to to keep performing at a high level. But if you don't then develop that curiosity, that humility, when you get to these leadership positions, you're bound to fail, I think, and not not sustain excellence over time. Do you feel like you've you've seen that or maybe that was partially Ryan Hawk as he worked his way up the ladder. What's that? What's that? That you were more heavily weighted on on confidence and courage as you kind of tried to achieve your goals in the in the corporate world and maybe didn't have all that curiosity and humility as you at, at the same time and had to develop that that other part curiosity and humility when you got to a leadership position. Had to develop a second part of that yeah. equation. Like, yeah, I, w- I would say for sure. If anything, especially coming off the football field, uh, there is an abundance of confidence, borderline arrogance um, as a quarterback. And in a way, it's it's not the worst trait or quality to have. If you look at some of the most successful quarterbacks in the NFL, particularly Tom Brady and Aaron Rodgers, Patrick Mahomes, these guys believe that they can fit the ball anywhere. They have this overwhelming belief in themselves that they will be able to move the ball down the field and and, and win. Um, and so I, I, that's how I felt. I mean, I, I felt like when I went out in the field, my preparation was going to lead me to be invincible. Um, and so you take some of that in the business world. It's not always not always good. I mean, it, it, it's, it's, it's that overconfidence, borderline arrogance could be a problem. Um, yes, as I matured and became uh, just more grown up and less immature in the business world, that's when um, I started really getting into books and learning. And one book would lead to the next, to the next, to the next. And then I would see other leaders who I thought were really good. And I would ask them what they're doing. And, and they're all well-read people. And then I would also see bad leaders, which we all know some of those are a bad boss. And you would look at what they do and they're never reading because they've already got it all figured out. They already have all the answers. They already know everything. They've got it. And so I thought like, I don't want to be like that guy and I do want to be like her. So I'm, I'm, I'm following in like those footsteps of the one who was the well-read, curious, humble leader versus the overconfident, arrogant, I've got it all figured out, you know no problems here type of a leader. And so I, I, that, that it was just a, a process to learn and that took, took years still, it's still in process, right. you know, it always yeah. will be right. Yeah. Hey golf pros. How many times have you dealt with a frustrated customer that was never updated on the status of a special order? What about the member that was never told his club arrived as it sat in the corner of the office for days on end? Have you ever wished that you could have a more foolproof special order process so that nothing fell through the cracks and your customers left happy and satisfied every time? Just think about how that could improve your sales. Golf Genius Golf Shop is here to help. Golf Shop is the only product on the market created to help your golf retail business communicate with your customers and organize your orders so you can provide the experience your customers have come to expect in today's retail environment just like the big box stores and online retailers. Place an order, an email or text goes out notifying your customer. Update the status of an order and another notification goes out. The order arrives, just click a button and let them know it's here. Plus you can customize the notifications to match your specific needs. I'm always looking for ways to be more productive and save time. That's why I've been using Golf Genius Golf Shop since it was released last year. I love the efficiency it has added to our special orders. My members appreciate the constant communication and our staff isn't bogged down sending emails or making phone calls every time an order arrives. I can easily check if an order is taking longer than expected by viewing the special order dashboard, which keeps me up to speed with any orders that need attention. The result is increased sales that come from a more consistent, reliable, and efficient special order process. Put a stop to the endless questions about, did you place my order or is my order here? And get Golf Genius Golf Shop. For more info, go to golfgenius.com. How do you respond to somebody that that 
either tells you or gives you the sense that they feel like leadership or becoming a better leader is just kind of a nice to have or something that uh, they'll get to eventually. I, I, there's a sense, I think, uh, out there that leadership and becoming a better leader is kind of either boring or I don't have time for it. How do you respond to those people? Well, I think it's it, it's been labeled as a soft skill. Um, you know, I, I just try to relabel it as an essential skill. Um, and I also would, if it's somebody like that, um, I, I, depending on how much I, I care to change their mind, uh, I may just let them go and figure it out. But if I, if I, if I, there's a good reason to change their mind, I, I would probably cite, um, some other, companies or other groups who really value uh, time and place emphasis on development of people as leaders and show how maybe that helps the bottom line. If that's something that that particular person is really interested in, like if they say, oh, you don't have, we don't have time for that. We've got to hit the number or we have revenue metrics or targets that we must achieve. And so then I would try to understand the psychology behind what do they care about and then how, what excellent leadership, how that leads to their ultimate goal, their end state. And so maybe it helps them stumble upon that in a different way by leading through what they're most interested in. If it's a specific goal that, that what I'm like excellent leadership will help you achieve this goal. Um, I will tie that, those things together as opposed to just lecturing them or, or preaching to them about why leadership is so important. I think that's one of the challenges in our industry. We, uh, a lot of us uh, and a lot of the audience, they're, they're working at private golf clubs where the focus is on the membership and, and customer service and, and serving their members. And, uh, and it's easy for leaders to get bogged down by that and lose track or lose sight of the fact that the people that they're working with are really what makes all that happen and that the better that they lead those people – the better the result is going to be for the members at the club and and the bottom line at the club, the leaders at the club that are looking for us to to drive the results. And uh, I think, but sometimes getting that picture across to people that don't believe that or they come from an old school mentality uh, or kind of a command and control mentality or that's the way I was brought up. So, you know, you're going to work 80 hours a week and blah, blah, blah. Uh, and that's going to produce, you know, the results that we're looking for. Certainly not relevant uh, or the best way to lead in this day and age. But I want to jump into the book for everybody to give uh, everybody a little understanding of the framework that you used for this book. Because I think that was really one of the, the huge benefits of this is the simplistic outline that you use in hitting on these three main points of leading yourself, building your team, and then leading your team which is really an insightful way to think of this. So in leading your team, you talk a lot about uh, personal development, personal growth, and the importance there. You also talk about productivity, and I'm, I'm a bit of a productivity junkie. I'm, uh, I'm always looking for different systems and ways that I can keep myself better organized, accomplish more tasks, lower my stress levels, and, and getting a lot of tasks done. And I think a lot about this quote that you included in the book that uh, I had heard from James Clear about you don't rise to the level of your goals, you fall to the level of your systems. I truly think that's one of those quotes that's going to go down in history with Peter Drucker quotes and John Maxwell quotes that you mm -hmm. just is one to live by. So yeah. with that said, what are some of the systems that you've created over time that if somebody said you can't do that anymore, you'd say, uh oh, uh, I'm really going to struggle now, or what am I going to do now? What are those, those, those uh, non-negotiable systems that that you've implemented in your life um hmm. non-negotiables i mean doing stuff like this having long-form one-on-one conversations with interesting people uh is part of my learning process um i prefer the the this manner uh to maybe larger groups um, but I, I would say like, if, if you think about like my framework, which I also have outlined of how I like what, what, it, what makes up a good day, it's really in four parts. And I want to spend hopefully a portion of every, uh, I want to spend every day, hopefully doing these four things in this particular order. And, and the first part of that is, is the consumption of knowledge, uh, read books, listen to podcasts, watch Ted talks, whatever, whatever it may be, right. I need to be a consumer of knowledge. That's the first part of this framework of how to behave for me, my system. 
Second, <clears throat> I must experiment with what I've learned. You can't just be a learner. You have to be a doer. You have to actually put it into play. We learn who we are in practice, not in theory. So put whatever I'm consuming into play, experiment. Third, take a step back, reflect, analyze what I have done based upon what I've, what I've consumed. So I've, I've done these series of experiments. Perhaps one example could be I read about a new way to open a meeting. And so I tested out a new opener to the meeting that I'm leading, whatever. And I, and I'm going to bring somebody with me to watch and observe and perhaps coach me. And so part of that reflection is, okay, I read about this way to open a meeting. I'm experimenting with it during my next meeting. I brought a coach with me to help me reflect on that. So I can, I can do a, a, a real time after action review to say, yes, keep doing that or no, didn't work. Let's, let's move on to the next experiment. And then the fourth, the fourth stage of that, something that I'm doing now and, 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 and doing uh, quite frequently is teach. Um, the best tool for learning that I've come across is teaching because it forces you to get clear on what you believe and what you think. It forces you to really get to the essence of a message and break it down into its core and distinct parts and then figure out what's most important for this particular audience and how am I going to portray that? What am I actually going to say? What am I going to show on the screen behind me to help reinforce my message, right? The teaching and the preparation leading up to the moments when you are teaching is when a ton of learning happens. So if I can do if I can be a consumer of knowledge, experiment with that, reflect on that, and then teach, that's a really good day. And so that's my system for how I behave, how I make choices, how I act on a daily basis is is in those four parts. How do you how do you think about balance when it comes to a great day? You're you know you're a busy uh, business owner running uh, the learning leader and everything that you're doing. You're also a husband and, and a father. How have you worked that uh, into your life so you can be successful on both fronts? Yeah, so I think it's important to kind of find what works best for you. For me, I'm I'm an early riser, so I'm able to wake up usually about three hours before the rest of my family wakes up and that can be time just to myself. And so, um, it's, it's important for me to have a proper, uh, way to start each day. Um, and a lot of that is dealing with my mind and my body. And so a combination of writing and reading and stretching, getting hydrated, working out every day, um, and then after I get done with that, going on a long walk, uh, to think, to take notes, um, to listen to podcasts, to learn, and then and then being with my family in the morning uh, with their school, then you know being with them prior before they go to school, or taking our youngest to preschool, driving her there, and then you know my day is blocked out for for work, um, but I also uh, do my best to to be home, be there for breakfast and for dinner. Um, and when I'm traveling, obviously that doesn't happen, but when I'm not traveling, usually that happens. And then to be very engaged in their sports as well. So basically it's a combination of making the most of your time when you're going to be devoted to work. Uh, in my case, getting up, uh, hours before they wake up so that when they are ready to go, I am too. And then when it's time to work, get the work done, uh, in order to be able to not have to to be doing the work while you're with them at night. And then there are nights where my wife and I both will uh, perhaps crack the laptops back open after our girls go to bed and we may do work for another hour or two. And that's, that's usually how I behave. Now, when I'm in book writing mode, you know, that I would say there is more emphasis and focus on getting to my word count per day goals that I set that can cut into other aspects of my work, of my business, and sometimes my family. But those are kind of the the trade-offs that you make uh, at times. And, and there's never perfect balance. I never try to even have perfect balance. I just try to be there for important moments. If my daughter's doing a one-on-one -on -one private volleyball session, well, I'll be the person to shag the ball so I can one be there with her. I can watch her and she'll get more repetitions with her serves and sets and hits and passes if I'm there shagging balls. So why not do that? So like things like that, I just try to think of like, what's a, what's a way that I could 
optimize this process and also spend more time with my family when possible. And, and, and things like that happen as a result. So another good example of being intentional, knowing that, that you want to spend the right amount of time with your family and on your business. And rather than hoping that that would happen or seeing if it would happen, carving out that specific time to make sure that that happens. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know what I would do without getting up early to get my personal time mm -hmm. in. Uh, and it took having kids for me to, to start doing that. So what's your setup? How many kids and like, what's your, what, how do you, how do you manage this? So I have a 10 year old and a seven year old. And yeah. one of the challenges though, that our, our days start pretty early. If you choose uh -huh. to get there, when, when the day starts, our golf shop opens at seven thirty or 7am, depending on the day. But so sometimes my personal time might be getting to the club early and, and being in my office to to get some of that personal learning time in and and maybe just for me sometimes it's knocking out some of the trivial tasks that I have to do so that I can be attentive during the rest of the day sometimes I do that at home and it's easier to to walk downstairs at 5 30 a.m or 5 a.m and and get that stuff done for two hours and then still be at the club by eight o'clock so you know for me that involves it involves reading uh it involves planning out my day down to you know in in specific blocks and really put myself in whatever position I need to to be able to make sure that I'm attentive to the people that I'm going to be with the rest of the day whether that's the people I work with the members of the club or, and then my family when I get home so that's also the only way that I've been able to do this side project where I'm doing the podcast and I, and I do writing for a website that I started as well and that all happens before 7 30 as far as uh, the writing and the planning for this so Nice. Uh, hmm. I'm I'm with you as far as how important that that time is. Couldn't do without it. Yeah, very cool. Very cool. So getting to the next part of the book, you talk about building your team. And there are some great quotes in this part of the book. Uh, Jim Collins told you, author of Good to Great, he told you on your episode that uh, take care of your people, not your career. Your dad, who you mention a lot as, um, I guess, the number one mentor, leadership mentor in your life, told you that hiring, training, and developing the right people will make you rich and famous in your industry. Uh, that's certainly something I think that we subscribe to in the golf business. Uh, and then you go on to say, those who hire well have the greatest odds of sustaining excellence over time. That right there, that's a pretty heavy statement. You have the greatest odds of sustaining excellence over time if you hire well. I think as leaders and managers, we all know the importance of hiring and how great it is when we, when we do hire well. However, many of us aren't experts at it, and I don't feel like put the time into it to be better at it. So for those of us that need to get better, what would you say is the, the first couple things that we could do to get better at hiring? First, I think I would get very clear on what you value. Um, an exercise I'll often do with leadership teams as they're looking to grow is we'll sit down and say, and there'll be a, you know, I'll be around a table or on zoom with a number of leaders and I'll say, okay, what are you looking for? What do you value? What do you want? And the amazing thing that happens uh, often when we're doing that is they don't know, or they have wide variety of what they're looking for amongst the leaders and the team. And what it shows me is they have not taken the time to get clear on what they want. Now, when it's very cool is when it's evident and obvious that they've already done that part, that they are very clear on, we value this, this, and this. And these are the kind of non-negotiables, as you said, or the must haves in a person that we're going to hire on our team. That's first. If you've done it, great. If not, do it. Next, though, is designing the interview process to understand if they possess the qualities that you want. Actually thinking about what questions are we going to ask and why we ask them. When I was a brand new manager, Dean, I uh, uh, was starting to interview for the open positions on my team. I had no idea what I was doing. And so I actually... Uh, I asked another manager who'd been doing it for a few years and I was like, what do we, you know, how do we, how do you do this? What should we do? And he forwarded me an email that had been forwarded to him two years prior. And the attachment in the email was this word document that looks very dated with just like 30 questions, just random interview questions. And he's like, Hey, this helps me out or whatever. And so I just started asking those questions and there was no rhyme or reason. There was no purpose. None of them really made sense. There was, I 
ask in random order and then I'd get done and they'd be like, what do you think? And I'd say, well, I think they're pretty good, you know, or I don't know, I'm not sure. Nah, they're not that good. And there was no process. There was no purpose. There was nothing behind it. It was just a kind of a gut feel based on the person. And I, I, I never identified what I cared about, what was valuable, what led to sustaining excellence in that particular role, and then how to identify that. And so to me, it's the it's just really getting clear on what you value, on what you want, and then creating an interview process to determine if they exhibit those qualities. And then also obviously background checks and other aspects to check check with others to see if they've exhibited those in real life in previous jobs or interactions with people. That alone, I mean, there's more to it, but that alone will put you past most people and the level of thought and intention that they have when it comes to who they're choosing to bring onto their teams. Yeah. And I think that's something that we miss in, in the golf industry. I, I, I often think back to when I was interviewing for my current position and they asked me a lot of questions about, you know, um, what's your playing background? What's your merchandising philosophy? What's your teaching philosophy? And now 10 years into this position, there's a merchandiser, a full-time merchandiser. We have a full-time teacher. Uh, I play golf occasionally. Uh, I play a lot at the club, but I, those things that they asked me that seemed important at the time, we have other people that are, are heading up a lot of those uh, tournaments is another one. How do you, how do you run events? Well, a lot of the other staff leads the administration of the events, but nobody asked me a question about my leadership philosophy or how I, how I help motivate people or how I evaluate people, how I coach people when that's really what we do almost all day. <laughs> so yeah. valuable insight though about defining of defining what we want and then creating those questions that are going to peel that out and i would imagine during the interview process trying to really dive into and not not letting people off the hook with simple general answers maybe to some of those questions well i mean as you know as someone who interviews people the 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 gold usually comes from the follow-up questions the first one gets the conversation started on whatever it is that you're talking about but then being an active listener as the interviewer and then asking the follow-up based upon what that person says is where and, and then maybe asking again and again to go deeper and maybe for examples or whatever it may be keep pushing the envelope a little bit further when it comes to, to, to getting more specific around, you could start high and broad at this, the zoomed out view, but then you, you, you zero in on specifics, understanding if that person has, like for me, if I really care if someone has, if they're thoughtful, then they're, then I'm going to ask questions that the, the, the initial question may, may not even matter. It's going to be on, well, I'm, I'm determining how thoughtful they are about whatever topic we said. And so I want to hear their process to how they think, what do they, how do they go about something? What's their, how do they learn? What's something recent they've learned about? And then I'll keep pushing and pushing and pushing in regards to that, to, to identify if that person truly is a thoughtful person. And uh, it's not always comfortable. It's not always fun. Um, it takes some work, but uh, I found that to be beneficial in the long run, right? Because, you, you know, you want to get those things right at the beginning. You, you mess up too many of those. It's costly. It could ruin your culture and your team. Uh, productivity will really decrease because you're always in this state of having to fire people and then hire people. And that, that just takes a lot of time. Well, another question that I was not asked in an interview process that I think is really important, and you hit on this in the third part of the book, in leading your team. Uh, I was never asked how I communicate, how I communicate with, uh, <laughs> with coworkers, with my team, and maybe asked about how I was going to communicate with the members of the club. But uh, internally, it's so important. And you write about how, as a new manager, this wasn't something um, that you really excelled at first right off the bat but that you got better at over time. So what, what was difficult for you in, in, in managing that communication and how did you address it to become a better communicator? Well, if you think about the, the role of a leader in a business, so much of it is about communicating your message and your ideas effectively or not. So we have meetings as managers, 
Uh, we write a lot of email as managers. We, in order to do a good job, um, we have to collaborate with people usually from other parts of a business that maybe don't, they don't report to us or they're not even affiliated us, but, but having them as a collaborator can make my team stronger or set my people up for success in a better way. And so the ability to write effectively is critical and everybody, everybody should work on becoming a more effective writer regardless. Um, and then getting up in front of your group and speaking, um, the, this was pushed on me by my dad um, early, early on when he said, if, if you have the ability to get up in front of a group of people and effectively deliver a message, he will get far more credit than you even deserve. Uh, so it's a skill that can really propel your career and it'll make your team better if you can be vividly clear in your messaging on here's the goal, here's how we're going, and here is your specific role and task in helping us achieve that goal. And and so I, I, I remember I did, the, I did this gift for my dad when he turned 60 where I asked like 40 people to write me a note uh, and all the answer was why I love Keith Hawk. And that, that was the prompt. And then you just tell me why you love him. A lot of people worked with them. Some of them didn't. And a number of them mentioned the emails that my dad wrote as their leader. Think about that. Who would write about the, the emails? And they'd say there's nothing quite like a Keith note, meaning the emails that my dad would send. And I thought, wow, like these actually impacted people in a way. Be, and I obviously I've seen him. I email with him constantly. Uh, just yesterday, he wrote me an amazing one. And I think, so these, these kind of tasks or skills that maybe some people don't think are that important, or they think are just kind of fine. They're, they, they lump them in there with 50 other things. No, becoming an excellent writer and an excellent speaker, force multipliers in your life and in your career, focus on those things. And so communication, I mean, there's books obviously written just on this skill alone, but communication as a leader, it's critical. You know, that's why it's good that you're doing a podcast and you're writing, right? It's going to make you by, by the fact of forcing yourself in the situation to have these conversations, to write, to get your thoughts out on the page will make you better in all other aspects of your job as a leader. And so if you care about that, I, I, I advise people to invest on working on those and developing those skills. And I think it's easy for us to overlook that we're, we're in front of people a lot. We get up in front of our membership for different reasons, usually not for that long. It might be a few minutes at a time, but still pro projecting confidence and skill and ability there. We do understand that people are looking to us to be stand up there as a leader uh, and be able to speak in front of people with, with that air of confidence and certainly takes practice. And if it was not for this, I thought I was pretty good at that. <laughs> and I, I go back to my first interview that I tried to do or that I did for the podcast now a couple of years ago. And I was so excited when it was over. I said, wow, I did it. I pulled it off. I felt like it went great. And I downloaded the audio and I listened to it and I was mortified. I already, <laughs> I already knew I didn't really want to hear my voice on, on the recording, but the number of ums and ahs and that <laughs> I had in there, it must, it took me five hours to edit all of them out. And but that's certainly helped me now as when I get up in front of our membership. And maybe it's as simple as, as a, a hundred people in front of me wondering what the format for today's tournament is. But I can mm -hmm. do that with a lot more skill and hopefully with some eloquence that I wasn't able to do before. So I forced myself to to listen to some of these some of these recordings. So I'd encourage it's awesome. So I'd encourage anybody to, even if you don't do a podcast, try to do it on recording and then play it back or put yourself on video. You you could be mortified just like I was. <laughs> it's awesome. I love it. Well, Ryan, I just want to thank you for coming on and for the time. I I really I respect what you said about coming on and, and doing this and paying it forward. And hopefully sometime I get a chance to pay it forward to to somebody out there that uh that wants to do the same and so i that really means a lot to me where can everybody look to get uh, more info about the podcast and the book yeah uh learningleader.com is where pretty much everything is housed for me that's my home base uh and also for people that are uh on their phones you can text the word learners to 44222 and you get everything that way as well 
All right. I encourage everybody to listen to the podcast, get the book, get on Ryan's email list for the Mindful Monday emails are really cool. A lot yeah. of great content in there. So, Ryan, thank you again. I'll be listening and uh, hopefully maybe sometime we can do this again. Love to. Thanks so much, Dean. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Golf Professional Growth Project. Be sure to rate and subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts and head to golfprofessionalgrowth.com for updates from GPG. GPG.